Uh, I'm going to do this today. I, we have uh, a pretty uh, intense passage to walk through, and I want to ask the Lord to give us a teachable spirit today in this place. Would you join me and pray, and you ask the Lord for that as well. Father, as we open your word, the Bible, we come and we recognize it is your word. It is uh, not just uh, another literary opportunity to read something nice or be encouraged. Lord, this is, these are your words, and we want to hear from you. We want to respond to you. We want to be teachable. Give us teachable spirits in this place. Holy Spirit, uh, impress on us what you have intended all along. Help us to see it clearly, who you are, what you've done, and how we are to live in response to who you are and what you've done. And w- Lord, we just say in this place, in this place today, all praise to the strong name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I, I want to just tell you, we're going to jump right into it. And I want to start with uh, by asking you if you heard this word. It's a word that has become very popular in this past, I would say, five years, though it's not, it's, it's older than that. But in these past five years, I've begun to hear, hear it on uh, an increasing scale. In fact, right now, I would tell you, if you pay attention throughout this week, you will hear it. If you listen to the news or do anything, you say, I don't listen to the news. If you are connected in any way, you will hear this term. Are you ready for it? Here's, here's the term. It is fake news. How many? All right, survey, survey. Before this morning, you've heard that term before. Raise your hand. All right, all right. This is an opportunity to be truthful. No fake news here. All right, good. All right, that's great. I'm going to tell you, as you say that term, I went to the internet, which we know is always truthful. That's, I hope you hear the sarcasm in that. I hope you did. Fake news. Here's the definition of it according to Wikipedia. Fake news, also known as junk news, pseudo news, or hoax news, is a type of yellow journalism or propaganda that consists of, now here, listen to these words, deliberate dis information or hoaxes spread via traditional news media print and broadcast or online social media online social media i think that's where fake news thrives it thrives there this is the truth fake news isn't new fake news isn't new though it has grown and grown and it's probably more prevalent than we've ever seen it maybe because we have such access to media more than we've had in all of history to this date. And so we see that uh, understanding truth well is very important. It is ultimately important. And we're going to see today as we open our Bibles that there will be three types of news that we will encounter. We'll encounter good news, we'll encounter bad news, and then we will also encounter fake news, fake news. And so let's understand from God's word how to receive and deal with each of these news, uh, different ways of receiving news. And so let's be in God's word together. If you have a Bible this morning, would you take that out? If you need a Bible, would you just raise your hand and uh, we'll bring it to you. If you're an app user, uh, it's in front of you. In fact, I checked it. It says good, bad, and fake news. That's the title this morning. Good, bad, and fake news. Very creative there. Very creative. We're going to be in the, not the gospel, but the letter to the church at Rome. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Rome. So second half of your Bible, if you're scrolling down, it'll be toward the end. Uh, Romans is where we'll be, Romans chapter 1. And as we go there, you need to know that the church that he is writing to, these Christians, they are young Christians. That doesn't mean they're young necessarily all of them in age, but they are all very young in their faith. They're very young in their faith. This letter was penned somewhere in the mid-50s, 50s AD. Uh, and we know that it was penned in that amount of time to these folks who needed to understand what does it look like to love Jesus, follow Jesus, when they had not grow, grown up with knowing any of this other than all of the false religions that they were surrounded with. Rome, uh, a capital of false religion. In fact, they had fake news in that way all day long, all the time. That all of these gods are real, all of these statues are real, all of these idols are real. And they would have to encounter that. But today, I want you to know that uh, today's passage is, is pretty, 
direct, very serious, very uh, easily misunderstood if we don't walk through it with very teachable spirits. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Listen to uh, how it begins. For the wrath of God. We, that, that for some people say, I can't read any further. I can't read any further. I don't want to hear about that. This is where we have to understand it correctly. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That means humanity. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Would you just do uh, me a favor right now and underline that suppress the truth. That is an important understanding, a key, pivotal understanding. That is what happens across the globe that people suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Where, where has he shown us this? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You might just put some parentheses around that last part. I am without excuse. You are without excuse. Every person across the globe is without excuse because of what God has revealed about his character, about his nature, about who he is, even through what has been made, through creation. He has revealed a lot about himself. We call that general revelation. God has shown this to everyone. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged. This is a terrible exchange. A terrible exchange. The glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's a terrible exchange. The glory of the immortal God or creeping things. Now, as we read this and as we open this letter, this is not just a letter from a man named Paul. You know, this is truly God's word for us. Amen? Amen? Let me give you another shot at that. This is truly God's word for us. Today, amen. amen. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're not there yet, you're like, I'm not sure yet, then I want you just to let this settle in. I want you to understand it because it's going to tell us a lot about who God is. It's going to tell us a lot about who we are and then how we are to respond in that whole understanding. And let's just go ahead and see this, that verse 18 begins with bad news. It begins with bad news. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And you say, I don't want to hear about the wrath of God. I want to hear about the love of God. You will understand the love of God more accurately when we understand that the wrath of God is real as well. Wrath of God is real. And I want to come back to that in just a moment. But I want you to see always text in context. I always want you to see that the letter to the Roman church and this letter to you and I did not begin with the wrath of God. In fact, it did not begin with bad news. It began with good news. The letter began with good news. How many of you are fans of good news? Go ahead. You're fans of good news. Give me some good news today. Give me some good news. When I pick my kids up from school, I'll often ask them, I say, tell me one good thing. I want to hear one good thing. Tell me one good thing. Well, this is what happened. This is what happened. I want to hear one good thing. Then you can tell me the other things. But you, I want to hear one good thing. And it's just a discipline to be able to say, we need good news. We need that. In fact, if you notice, we began reading at verse 18. But if you just went up the page or up your screen, just, just by two verses to verse 16, it says this in Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Gospel means good news. I'm not ashamed, I'm not, I'm not scared, I'm not going to hide from you the good news. And there is good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. Oh man, I would circle that, I would circle that. This is for everyone who believes. This good news is for you, it's for me, it's for your neighbor, it's for your friend, it's for your coworker. First to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That means the good news first came to the Jewish people and it didn't stay there. It also spread to the rest of us. The rest of us. Jewish and non-Jewish alike, the good news is for everyone. 
And I love that the letter opens with good news. Do you know that God always leads? I was telling somebody this this week out of Exodus 34 when God is saying this about who he is. He's describing himself. He says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And then it talks about his justice. And then it talks about his wrath and dealing with sin. But he always leads with compassion and mercy and grace. He tells you that that's who he is. That's how the book uh, of Romans begins this letter to the Romans. It begins with good news. It begins with good news. And this is the fun part about it. We see that God loves and is offering salvation and forgiveness of sins to everyone. And this good news can truly only be understand, uh, understood when we understand this. How do I understand the good news? When I understand my need. When I understand my need for forgiveness and salvation, then I'm ready for it, then I'm hungry for it, then I want it, give it to me. When you understand your need, that's why verse 18 begins a whole section that will take us through Romans chapter three, verse 20. It'll take us all the way uh, through uh, that section saying, I want you to understand your need. I want you to understand why you need good news. Now, as he explains this to us, it will be personal. It will be painful because the bad news is that humanity and these next verses will be exposed. That includes you and I, that we'll be exposed for what's happening in our hearts and in our minds and in our, our souls. It will be exposed. You and I will need to ask the Lord as we look at this today to give us a teachable spirit to understand not only the good news, but the bad news. Let me give you some bad news. The bad news is this, the wrath of God is real. But many people do not understand it. In fact, they don't like that term of wrath. The wrath of God. Let me tell you what the wrath of God is not, and then we can understand how it is, all right? Here, here it is. If you're a note taker, get this. What the wrath of God is not. Not. It is not impulsive, an impulsive outburst of anger aimed erratically at people whom God does not like. Some religions... Some religions do teach, and many of the Roman gods were this way. They were erratic. One day they liked you, and the next day they hated you. One day they loved you, and, and they, they wanted to lift you up, and the next day they wanted to throw you into the pit of hell. And this, this was erratic. The Romans understood this, but that is not the God of the Bible. That is not the living God. The wrath of God is not an impulsive outburst of anger aimed erratically at people whom God does not like. It is, it is, here's what it is. It is settled, determined, a, a settled, determined response of a righteous God, a God who is perfect and holy against sin. I'll give you a good definition for sin here. Sin is anything I think or say or do which is against the character and person of God. It is a settled, the wrath of God is a settled, determined response of a righteous God against sin. He has to deal with it. His perfection demands it. His holiness demands it. He can't allow humanity just to do whatever they want. Let me tell you that the Bible records for us several places what the wrath of God, just a, just a touch of it. You'll see it in the, the Old Testament with the, with the flood, the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Sending Adam and Eve out of the garden. The wrath of God. The most graphic revelation of God's holy wrath is found at the cross when he poured out divine judgment on himself. God the Father pouring it out on God the Son. God the Son receiving all of the judgment that should have been on us is poured out on him. Judgment is called for. In fact, in this passage, it tells us it's called for in our lives because we do this one thing. I asked you to underline it there. We suppress the truth. We suppress the truth. We cover our ears. We cover our eyes. We don't want to know that there's a God. We don't want to listen to him. We don't want to have to obey him or acknowledge him. We want to do what we want. We suppress the truth about God. 
In fact, I, I noted this. In order to suppress it means we had to already possess it. That means we possess it and we say, I don't like it. I don't want to look at it. I'm going to keep it over here. Let me give you just a, a simple way we do that uh, by sharing a story with you that comes from Dennis and Barbara Rainey. Dennis and Barbara Rainey, uh, just amazing godly people who started the ministry called Family Life Today. You can go and see it, familylifetoday.org. They do so much uh, to talk about how to have homes and marriages and parenting that looks like Jesus. In fact, uh, I, would, I would tell you, there's so much there. Go and check it out. They're the ones who began the weekend to remember marriage retreats. Uh, they have so much to say about grandparenting uh, as they have now uh, come into that stage of life. But they share this story about how their three-year-old suppressed the truth. Uh, one of their kids, uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, they were sleeping in, and the door burst open, and the three-year-old came and jumped up on the bed and said, Mom, Dad, time to get up. Mom, Dad, time to get up. And this little girl in her jammies was covered in Hershey's chocolates. It was all over her face. It was down her neck. It was all over her jams. She was coated in it. And uh, immediately when you kind of open your eyes and say, what? what? What is that on you? It's chocolate. It's not motor oil. Looked like motor oil for a second. It's chocolate. And then they asked the question. They said to their little girl, did you go out? Did you get out of bed? and go out to the kitchen and open the fridge and get out the can. By the way, this is before squeeze bottles of Hershey's chocolate. This is when you had to do open the can of Hershey's chocolate and then you put the lid back on it and put it back in the fridge. Did you go out, did you get out of your bed and go out to the kitchen and get the Hershey's chocolate and drink it? Did you do that? Is that what happened? Nope. No. That did not happen. That did not happen. Another taste test, it's Hershey's chocolate. They said, listen, mommy and daddy are very serious about truth. Truth is important. We want you to tell us the truth. That is, that is, it's okay to tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. Did you get out of bed and go out to the kitchen, open the fridge, get the can of Hershey's chocolate out, drink it, and then put it back? Nope. They said, okay, come, come with us. Let's go out to the kitchen. They take their little three-year-old. They go out to the kitchen together. They open the fridge. By the way, there's a pool of Hershey's chocolate on the floor with little chocolate feet prints, footprints, you know. That, it sounds like something that should be on a plaque, you know, like footprints in the sand. This was different, footprints of chocolate through the house. And they said, there's the chocolate can. Drip, 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 drip. Did you... Tell us the truth. This is important. Did you get out of bed, come out to the kitchen, get out the Hershey's chocolate, drink it, and put it back? No, I didn't. I didn't. Listen, folks, the evidence is everywhere. It's everywhere. The child could not bring themselves to tell the truth, even though the evidence was everywhere. They were suppressing the truth and they said, hey, you know, you're not in trouble. By the way, the issue is not Hershey's chocolate. It's not. Hershey's chocolate is meant to be opened. It's meant to be, maybe not like this, <laughs> but it's meant to be enjoyed. It, that's what it's for. It's Hershey's chocolate syrup. That's what it's for. That is not the issue. The issue was the truth and the suppression of it, even though the evidence was everywhere. And they had to work through, and I was, remember uh, Christy and I were listening to this about how they had to work with their kids about what is the real issue and what they would discipline over, and the discipline was not rage and anger. No, the, the, the discipline is to say, we need you to understand that telling the truth, the truth is important. The truth is important. Because we are prone to suppress the truth. And that brings us to the third type of news. We've had good news. The gospel is good news. Bad news is that uh, we suppress the truth all the time. And how we suppress it is the third type of news. It's fake news. Fake news. In fact, we're, we are all, I just want you to realize this. Fake news isn't just from some news source. It's not just from this news source or that news source. Fake news is generated by our very hearts. We generate deliberate 
disinformation to ourselves and to those around us. First, we preach disinformation to our own hearts. It's not wrong. This is okay. God won't mind. It doesn't matter. We preach bad information, disinformation to ourselves, and then we spread it around. We generate wrong ideas about God. We generate wrong ideas about ourselves. We generate deliberate disinformation. Let me give you, and this is from uh, uh, a pastor I was listening to and uh, reading from some of the things as I was preparing for this message today, uh, where he talked about uh, two popular versions of fake news regarding God. Two popular versions of fake news regarding God, prevalent in our day and age. This is from Pastor Tim Keller. Uh, this is what he says. There's the liberal view of God. The liberal view of God is this. God is so loving, I can do whatever I want and he will have to accept me. I can live any way I want and he's just so loving, he'll just say, ah, doggone it, I love you. It's okay. That, that wasn't good, but it's okay. The liberal view of God is God is so loving. He's love, he's love, he's love. And he is, don't miss that. He is. He is. But it means I can live any way I want and he'll just have to accept it. And then there's another, and you take it to the other extreme. We're people of extremes in humanity. The other extreme is the fake news that is the conservative view of God. Where it says this, I'll adhere to a strict moral code and if I do good things and I, I do more good things than somebody else, God will have to love me and accept me because I am relatively good. I'm relatively good. And so this is the, this is the fake news. God is so loving, he'll have to accept me. That's a liberal view. He, the conservative view is I'll try to do all the right things. I'll try to do all the right things and do very good things and God will look at that and say I like all the good things you do and therefore I accept you both of those are fake news both of those are fake news because you say how do you know they're fake news because both of these views both the liberal view and the conservative view leave me leave you in control leave you in control you're really the center of the universe there you're really God in that view I do these things, therefore you must accept me. That makes God your slave. I do whatever I want to do, and you're loved, so you have to accept me. That makes God your puppet. In the liberal view, and the conservative view, we are the center of the universe. And that, folks, is fake news that we preach to one another, and we preach to ourselves, and we say, we made God in our image. You say, well, what is the other view? What is it? Is there another view? There is. There is the biblical view of God that God reveals himself to us and it does not leave us in the center and it does not leave us in control. In fact, if we understand grace, such an important understanding, grace at all, I'll give you that definition, an outrageous blessing given to totally undeserving people. If we understand grace, an outrageous blessing given to totally undeserving people. It means that I am not in control. In fact, this is what it means, that I owe him everything. I owe him everything. That is the biblical view of God. There's fake news all around us. And you say, well, where does it come from? It comes from in our hearts. It comes from when we say we don't like the biblical view of God. I'm going to go with my own version. I'm going to go with my own version. In fact, if you look at this, I'm, I'm going to just tell you in chapter 1, it tells us that God has revealed himself so that you could see accurately that there is a God and that God is not you. The way he does that is through creation. Would you write this down, number one, today? That creation declares who God is. It declares who God is. You say, well, uh, how, how would I know about Jesus through, through creation? It's not that specific. You need, you need specific revelation to understand about Jesus, and he's given that to us in the Bible. Creation is general revelation that is really saying this. There is a God, and he's orderly, and he has a plan, and you're not the creator, and you're a part of creation. That gives you an accurate view of yourself. People don't want to hear that. But when I look around at creation, whether I'm the person who grew up 
on an island with no news and no electricity and no insight, if I have creation around me, and we do, says that I'm without excuse. So I cannot look forward to a day where I stand before the Lord and say, I didn't know. I didn't know there was a God. He said, I gave you creation. If I grew up in the city and I had all the things, all the amenities uh, that were uh, blessings and given to uh, humanity, and I had electricity and I had news and I had all these, these things that I could enjoy. And I, I cannot say when I stand before the Lord, I didn't know. I gave you creation. I gave you creation. And so that we are without excuse. In fact, I, I, I'm not sure many will say, I didn't know, but uh, there will be many that say, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know. I, I didn't want to believe. I wanted God in my, shaped in my own way. Which brings us to number two. We do this all the time. It's still happening today. Our hearts are idol-making machines. And what I mean by idol is a fake, false God, something that we put our faith and our worship into. And if you're thinking about, this is the first picture I have in my mind that comes to me with idols, is that there's that picture of the first Indiana Jones movie. And it's, it's kind of iconic now where he's, he's there and he's, he's going to take this idol and it's this little golden man Looks like a guy from Easter Island. He's going to take this little, he's got a bag of sand. And he's trying to make sure that the exchange is just right. And he's, he's, he's put some sand on the floor and he's like, okay. And he puts the sand on there and he takes his little golden idol. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got my little idol. And just as he's about to put it in his bag, he sees that all of a sudden the pillar lowers. And oh man, then he's running for his life. And, and we see that Hollywood has done this so well. But if that's the picture of an idol, that, that still is happening around the world that people are bowing down to little golden, little wooden, little things made out of stone. But in uh, much of the world, it's gotten far more sophisticated than that. We bow down to a certificate of achievement that says I'm valuable because I have this certificate and I have put my faith and my hope in me. People bow down and they say, I have this car. Because I have this car, I'm valuable and I worship it and I take care of it and I, and I show it off and this is what has my, my value. Uh, uh, people can, honestly, they can idolize their family. They can take what is good and from God and they can lift it to a position that is his position to have. An idol can come in all kinds of things. A trophy, a car, a vacation home, uh, an achievement. This is what it says when it said they, they made this exchange claiming to be wise, verse 22, verse 23, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. An idol uh, typically is something you can touch, something you can see, something you can possess something you can control. That's an idol there. And it's a terrible exchange. In fact, I wrote down just in my notes here, this is cosmic pornography. Here's what I mean by that. We exchange the glory of the immortal God for an image that we can control. For an image of mortal man, of birds, of animals, of creeping things. People worship their bodies. People worship gold. People worship achievements. It's everywhere. We're, our hearts are idol-making machines. I want you to think just for a moment, what, what in the past few months, we'll even extend it to the summertime, what in the past few months uh, called out to you for worship? And did you give it worship? What called out to you to say, this will bring you happiness? And if you have this, if you possess this, if you worship this, this will bring you what you're looking for? What idols have you been drawn to? It's everywhere. Your idol may not be the same as your neighbor's, but most of them do resemble something from nature. Something from nature. The problem with humanity is that we don't want to answer to the living God. We want Burger King religion. Let me explain that. Burger King religion looks like this. Burger King religion says, my way right away. My way right away. I want God my way. I'll make an idol. I don't like what God 
the, the biblical God says, so I'll go with the liberal view of God. I don't like what the biblical view of God says, so I'll go with the conservative God. I'll, I'll make God in my image or in the image of something. I'll do that. God said this is happening in every culture, across every, every continent, all across time. People have been doing this. And because people do this, if you were the creator and you saw your creation doing this, do you think it's worthy to address? Yes or no? Worthy to address? Yeah. Worthy to address. In fact, he said, it's right to say, that is against me. That is against me. The creator is saying, you cannot substitute creation in my place. In fact, he's going to go on and, and pronounce a sentence against this. Think of a, of a courtroom scene. The sentence against humanity for sin is all-inclusive. It's all-inclusive. Listen, if you go to an all-inclusive resort, that's a lot of fun because you can go and eat all you want and you can go uh, here at any time and all you want. You can go in and out of uh, different places. Hey, you want to go snorkeling on the beach? Go for it. Hey, that's all right. Hey, that's any time. It's all-inclusive. Everything's in this package. The sentence against sin is all-inclusive because every part of us, when we sin, sins against God. Every part of us sins. Oh, oh, I only sin against him a little bit in this area of my life. In these next verses, you'll read this bad news phrase. Bad news phrase. He'll say it three times, and when God says something rep uh, repetitively, you need to pay attention to it. He'll say it distinctly, this phrase. Here's the phrase he'll use. God gave them up. God gave them up. If you hear in that sentence or in that phrase, God gave up on you, that is not the truth of the scripture. He did not give up on you. He has not abandoned you, though some translations do say that God abandoned us. The right understanding, and I, I would just have you get this because if you don't get this, you will misunderstand God's very deliberate response to sin, his wrath. When it says God gave them up, this is a judicial term used for handing a prisoner over to sentencing. You have been convicted. The evidence is all there. You're covered in Hershey's chocolate of all kinds. The evidence is there, and you've been handed over for sentencing. That's when it says God gave them up. God gave them over. God had to deal with sin. He couldn't just let it happen. He couldn't just, just say, oh, it's okay. Now, I'm going to tell you, and I put a little asterisk in my notes here, warning. Many will find the passage we're about to step into very challenging and very difficult in light of our modern day culture. But I want to remind you that our modern day culture hasn't even touched yet what was happening in the city and in the people of the Roman world. Rome itself was in anything goes. It was Vegas plus. What happens in Rome was never intended to stay in Rome. What happens in Rome is intended to touch the whole world. And our culture, where we see a lot of things that have become very permissible, it doesn't even touch what was happening in Rome at that time. And as we understand this, these next verses, please be very, very thoughtful and very teachable. Here's what it says. Verse 24. Therefore... That's as far as we want to go. Put a square or circle something around the word therefore. Because God created us, because he gave us creation and he revealed himself, because he has shown us who he is, because he's gone so far as to say, I want every person to know there is a God and that they would not have excuse. And we still said, I don't want you. And we made an exchange and we make gods of all kinds and we refuse to worship him. Therefore, because of that, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged, here it is, the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The creator is blessed forever. Amen. That is true. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. 
for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. In verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up, third time he says it, to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil. I, I want you to, as I read through this list, see if you fit in this list anywhere. And if you say, I don't, you're not very, being very honest with yourself. This is not about the person down the row from you. I hope they listen to this. This is about you. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And then verse 32. Though they knew, know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. We not only do them, but we applaud when somebody figures out how to cheat on their taxes. We not only applaud them when somebody figures out how to steal at work without getting caught. We applaud them when somebody lives a very loose, immoral life and nobody has found out about it. Man, that is so awesome. Oh, man, you did that in Vegas and nobody found out. This is, we applaud it. Listen, that entire list, all of those verses brings us to one summation statement, which is the fourth point today. Humanity's problems are severe. Would you agree with that? Humanity's problems are severe. Would you agree with that? Yes. We are, we across the globe have all kinds of problems and they're not simplistic. It's not just a problem. There are all kinds of problems and they all stem back to this sin issue of us saying, we're going to do what we want, not what God wants. We're going to do what makes us happy, not what makes him happy. We're going to do what we want to do, and nobody's going to be an authority over us. Humanity's problems are severe. Now, I, I need to tell you that when you look at this, you say, well, what does God want me to do? What does he want? What does he want? I, just break it down for me. What does God want? I love, that is such a great question. In fact, that question was asked of Jesus. What does God want? Name it. What's, what's the number one thing God wants for my life? What's he want from me? Jesus answered it by quoting out of the book of Deuteronomy. He didn't answer it just like on the fly. Well, I think, I think, and I, he made it up. He is going to quote from the book of Deuteronomy in Matthew 22, 36 and 37. It says this. Teacher, that's what they said to Jesus. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, there, there's no hesitation like, ah, let me think about that. I'm not sure. He says this, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second, Jesus said, you can't do that without the second one happening at the same time. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Think through that list again. Envy, covetousness, strife, malicious, murder, all of those are against people. All of those are against others. All of those hurt and cause, bring pain. I want you to think about this. Jesus said, I want you to love me with everything you are. I want you to love me with all your heart. I want you to love me with all your soul, all your passions, all, all the things that, that stir in you, everything about you. I want you to love me with your mind, not just your feelings. I want you to love me with everything you are. That's what I want. Jesus didn't have to stumble around looking for words. He just quoted out of the book of Deuteronomy because it's always been that way. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. As we look at these 
statements. God gave them up. God gave them over to. God gave them up. Handed over. Handed us over for sentencing. You'll see that he is going to address every one of the hearts, soul, and mind. Because we refuse to love him with all our hearts. Here's the implication. Because we refuse to love him with all our soul and our passions and everything that, that stirs within us. Because we refuse that. Because we refuse to love him with our minds. He's got to address it. Look at this. The first thing. Given over. This is what he said. We were given over. We were, he gave them up to the lusts of the heart. This is a, the exchange, he says, of the truth of God for a lie. It's the exchange, a terrible exchange. We often make this terrible choice where we choose an imposter instead of the real deal. We preach fake news to our own hearts. We preach it first to ourselves and then we preach it to those around us. Anybody who will listen. Paul says this. He implies that all other religions are based on false ideas about the one true God. They are not just different paths to the same God. They're not. It, it's not just, oh, you call your God this and I'll call my God this and we'll do this and we'll do that. It's when somebody's clinging to the liberal view of God or somebody's clinging to the conservative view of God, this is, this is an easy breakdown. He's going to address two groups, Jews and non-Jews. The Jews clung to the conservative view of God. If I do this, I do all of these things, he will love me. He has to. Because I sacrificed I gave. I did this. The non-Jews said, there are so many gods. Take your pick. One of them will love me. One of them will love me. He said, he's given us over to the lust of our heart. If we worship and serve created things instead of the creator, this includes when we worship and serve ourselves. We're created. When we serve Anything in nature. Anything in nature. Uh, is it wrong to take care of the earth? No. God would call us to be good stewards of that. But when we worship it, we've elevated it to the wrong spot. When we worship angels, lots of religions worship angels. When we worship Satan himself, some people will do that. He is a created being. He is creation. God is saying anything that you exchange out of creation for me, the creator, I have to address that. I have to address that. Then he goes on to say this. He gave them over to dishonorable passions. We'll just call that the soul and everything that, that runs deep within us. Really, when we talk about our passions, even in modern culture, we are speaking of Sexuality at the core. Every kind of sexual immorality is addressed in this passage. Given over to means to become a slave to our own sexuality and passions. Sexuality and passions should serve us, but instead too many people are serving their passions. Now I'm going to tell you this, that this, this passage very clearly says that both lesbian and homosexual activities are condemned in these verses. But sexuality is not. God absolutely approves of sex and sexuality because he designed it and he created it and whatever he designs and creates is good. It is to be celebrated in the way that he said to. God wants sex and sexuality to be celebrated in monogamous, heterosexual relationships inside of marriage. That means he condemns adultery before marriage and within marriage, it means that he is as serious about all of it. Well, what about pornography? He's as serious about that. Instead of saying, I'm going to say, this is okay and this is not. This is okay and this is not. This is okay. He's not saying that. I know that as we look at this, that modern culture and Christianity disagree let's just just say it clearly if this passage is making you at all angry or upset please know that God was speaking to the Roman culture where anything goes the abuse of children 
Anything goes in the Roman culture. Anything could be pleasing to one of their gods. I heard a political candidate this last week on the news that said he had no room, there was, there was no room for biblical Christianity to lovingly disagree with the modern day LGBTQ movement. There was no room. It was on the news, it happened this week here in America. There is no room for disagreement, not loving disagreement. There's no room for it. This political candidate went on to say this, that he had already thought through how to bring punitive legal action against churches and Christians who held to the biblical view of sexuality and would not agree with all of the tenets of the LGBTQ movement. He had already thought how to punish Christians for that and churches for that. When I look at that, when I read this passage, I say, this, this is not new. This is not new. You need to understand that the Bible is very pro-sex. And when it says that we are to celebrate sexuality in the way that God designed it, it is to be enjoyed, it is good, it is right, it is wonderful. And we should not get put into a box where people believe that Christians believe that sexuality is wrong. We're just the opposite. We're pro-sexuality, but we can never be pro-immorality and the Bible and the living God must be our definition for what immorality is. And it's big. It's broad. God's saying, I have a, a very specific purpose for this and it is good and it is right. Enjoy this. I made this for you. But when people say, I want to do what I want to do, there will be disagreements. There will be disagreements. Now I'm going to tell you, we don't have enough time to sort through all the nuances and how to break down and what about this and what about that. But we should not be afraid. If you're a believer in Jesus, you should not be afraid to have good and honest, clear conversations that are loving. To be able to say, Let, let's talk about what God wants. Let's talk about what he wants. In fact, you may have some questions for me. You may just go ahead and just put that on a, a connection card and say, hey, I want to meet with you. I want to talk with you. I have questions about this. Can we, we talk about it? Absolutely, yes. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's understand. Let, let's see this rightly. Because I know that there are some Christians that they hone in on part of this and they forget the list at the end. And they want to put people into these categories. Good, better, best. And they're trying to figure out where they land in this. Do you know where we land in this? We land in the bad news. We land in the bad news. Every one of us, which ought to stir in our hearts a need and a desire for good news. Because he's not done yet. When he said he get, has given us over to a debased, corrupted mind. That list is so varied that you can't help but find yourself in it somewhere. Haughty, insolent, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, gossips, people who cause strife, who are deceptive, people who envy, people who covet. Do you see that he's saying all of that, all of that is against the person and character of God. There's bad news. Humanity has problems. And they are severe. And then he comes down to this. Verse 32. He said, sin, anything against what we say or think or do, which is against the person or character of God, carries an ultimate penalty. That we don't like. That we don't like. Instead of racing to repent after reading this, he says this, instead of racing to repent people race away from God in fact they applaud people who have decided to live for themselves decided to do what they want to do to who have decided to invent a God in their own image
humanity is applauding one another in the way we choose to live. God is saying, do you realize that what I want for you is that you would love me with all your heart and soul and mind? That's what I want. And yet humanity is running away from him and saying, I'm going to sin with my heart and I'm going to sin with my soul and I'm going to sin with my mind and there's nothing you can do about it. To find yourself in that place is bad news. To find yourself in that place is bad news. And that's all of us. That's why this should stir an aching in our hearts say, I need good news. I need forgiveness. I need salvation. Salvation from what? From the consequences of my sin. From the wrath of God because of my sin. I need good news. Here's the truth. I am worse than you can possibly imagine. And at the same time, Christ is greater than I can possibly imagine. Christ is greater than my sin. Grace is greater than my sin. He does not want us to be left in the bad news. And he doesn't want us creating more fake news. He wants us to run, run to him and say, give me grace, grace, forgive me, I need you. I just want to pray for us today, that's a lot. I re recognize it. Today you came, I said, I, you just came and said, I just need a little drink today and you got a fire hose. <laughs> All right, I admit it. The, this, this letter is, is so packed is so intense. You're like, give, give just a little more margin, Paul. He said, no, we got to talk about it. It's too important. We've, we've got to talk about it. I'm worse than I can possibly imagine. I'm worse than you can possibly imagine. But Christ is greater. His grace is greater. Would you just pray with me right now and let's ask the Lord to meet us here. To settle our hearts where we don't like something. To show us who He is how to respond to him, the true and living God. Father, we come to you and Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness for making up little false gods that serve us, that give us glory and praise us of all kinds. Forgive us for that, Jesus. Forgive us for not recognizing who you are, not honoring what you say is good and right. Forgive us. Lord, help us. We need you. Lord, even on our best day and we're trying hard, we usually tend toward a liberal view of you or a conservative view of you, and that is not what you want. Jesus, I pray that you would change every one of us. So that we would follow you willingly and joyfully and we would know how to love others in your name. Jesus, thank you that you took the wrath of the Father at the cross so that you could freely give us salvation. We need it.